Welcome to the Rise to the Challenge podcast. Joined today, she's an international speaker, podcast host, and author. It's Sharon Wolf. How are you doing today, Sharon? I'm good. I, uh, I'm i in Seattle area and it's a nice sunny day here and we always treasure our sunny days. <laughs> <laughs> We're so excited to have you on the show to talk about your rise to the challenge. What we like to do with all of our guests is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what were you involved in growing up? Uh, milk and cows, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in, uh, well, I was born in Anacortes, which is just you know, up there near Canada. And uh, when I was about eight years old, dad bought a farm in Eastern Washington and we wound up stacking hay and milking cows and um, being a farm girl. And you get a lot of values on the farm, you know, hard work and, uh, you know, walking your talk and reliability and all that stuff. So, but I was the middle of five and I kind of, you know, middle kids, tend to be invisible and um invisible was actually kind of one of my strategies because um there was sexual abuse in the home so i just you know as long as i could be invisible that was safe but um in my teen years i got really um fascinated with potential and you know like what's what's my potential but you know what's alex potential you mm -hmm. know so um, I've over the years kind of helped people with their, their uh, resumes because, you know, sometimes we're too close to ourselves to see ourselves objectively. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of led into my career. So go ahead. As the middle child, you talked about being invisible or trying to not be the focus in a way. Was the farm kind of a way to escape and kind of be that individual where you can enjoy nature, enjoy the animals, just enjoy learning more about yourself? Well, I've never had anybody ask that, but yeah, there could be. I, I've been reading this weekend a book called The Elephant Whisperer, and I really picked up on that whole process of learning from animals mm -hmm. and what nature and the environment tells you and how much it how much it can tell you if you have your eyes open and you know pay attention. But um, we didn't have that many you know friendly farm animals. We we always put some chickens, uh, raised chickens, to put them in the freezer for the winter and a, a steer or or uh, stock to be in the, you know, stakes for the winter. But um, yeah, do dogs were, a, they're still a big part of how I get my love. So yeah. Is there the a, freedom. is there the a freedom. favorite task that you had on the farm or were they I, all just not your favorite? Uh, I had a bad case of ringworm and I kind of keep my distance on cats. <laughs> It's hard to get rid of ringworm, so. With, you talked about abuse in the home. How were you able to kind of escape and not let it deteriorate of what you wanted to do and kind of moving forward throughout your days? Well, um, I, I had to get by without that uh, healthy father, um, affirmation and you know good clean love um i and, and i've always been kind of self-sufficient anyway and, and i was a learner in my family mm -hmm. uh, that's really what made me so different is i like to study and learn and getting good grades i figured was a good way to stay invisible <laughs> <laughs> you know and always be obedient so um uh, but the, as I went, I, I really did start dealing with that, um, that hidden part of me, I guess, until I was about 40, 35, 40 years old. And that's kind of a, wow. a season when, um, you, you start differentiating yourself from your parent as, as a child, you're, you know, make your own definition of yourself, but, um, you know, as what I'm doing now is so different from what I did in my career, it's related in that I like to empower people and help them believe in themselves, but I didn't do that that much in a career. It was more like a hobby for friends, 
but um, the whole, I, I know when I was in, I started coaching school the week before I retired in 2016. And uh, I remember coming back from class, you know, it was a few months into the program and I slapped the desk and stopped my foot and said, it's not okay to be invisible. I shocked myself. Wow. Where did that come from? <laughs> And it was it was the part of actually deciding to be visible. And over the last four or five years, I've I've challenged myself to love myself more. You know, I always wanted to be cherished. You know, somebody to cherish me. I can cherish myself. Actually, I can love myself. Actually, and now I'm wanting to help others love themselves from what's inside their value from their spirit or soul so you talked about invisibility and i kind of can relate into that where even with high school i was kind of that person that stood in the back was just getting the good grades just focusing on graduation not really trying to get out there kind of get involved in the after school stuff and things like that. But then as I got older, I'm like, I got to be out there a little bit more and just enjoy my life. But now I try to, you talked about cherishing, having people cherish. And I'm like, I, the things I do, I can cherish myself. Like if I accomplish something that just makes me excited, but you want to kind of have that from your friends where they're supporting you at the same time. But I think people want only their friends to say it and not really know that themselves can cherish that also. I was um, chatting with a guy on Instagram on Saturday and um, apparently he watched a couple of, I, I have a couple of TikToks out of getting some <laughs> visibility. And um, one of them, I, I'm using a hat. So I, I keep this fancy hat kind of handy, but I was, the ones I was using in the video were, were much more, um, low key hats but I was do I want this or do I want that you know kind of thing and and um you know finding your value from inside is kind of exciting and so how how cool is it but then I said oh no I'll just let my friends tell me how unique I am in my birthday cards and he heard that I said yeah it's kind of sad isn't it I because I've saved tons of um um birthday and Christmas cards over the years that was my my evidence that somebody loved me oh no <laughs> I've always been single and always been um yeah single and no kids and but I've also had no cancer no diabetes no hospital no you know so uh for being 74 I think I'm in darn good shape <laughs> yeah and it's a lot of people and I even think about well, okay, it's my birthday, but t is that the only time someone should reach out to me if you're my friend? Like, you should be able to reach out to me at any time. Like, it shouldn't just be a specific day or even the happy Christmas or Merry Christmas or happy Halloween. It's like, if you're a true friend, reach out. It doesn't have to be a specific reasoning. And I, I that's the part I hate because it's like, you value your friends in different ways. And especially in those situations, when you mentioned about the birthday card, it's like, you want that friend to be there no matter what. And you look like you're just enjoying life, which is so important. Well, yeah, I've, uh, it seems like I put so much work into this um, business. And this weekend, I actually did very little on the computer. Actually, <laughs> And I was reading this elephant book and it was such a delight. I, I just got a few more chapters to read in it, but it's, it's very fast moving and yet very, a lot to learn and appreciate about all his stories. But uh, yeah, I, I do need help, Alex, with having fun in life. <laughs> I just tell myself, you're going to go do something this month. And what is that? Start making a list and just go do it. I mean, I even tell my friends that like you, they talk about doing something and then they just, they are hesitant. It's like, just go do it. You, you don't want to look back years and say, I wish I did that. Yeah. There's about a, an ocean here, just t a mile away from me. And I've started saying, Sharon, go down and at least spend, you know, like an hour every week uh, down by the waterfront. And I finally did that somewhat yesterday, but I, I, I wanted to get my feet in the 
the water and um i don't think i have the right shoes to do that but um, <laughs> that's, that would really be getting into the water <laughs> as you're growing up what did you want to do in your career what was that dream job for you well I didn't do that much dreaming. Um, I just kind of went with the flow. You know, you're supposed to get a job and pay for your roof and pay for your car. And, and um, I, I, I know I distinctly remember, um, oh, my boss will move me along when he knows I'm ready. And, you know, after about 10 years, no, he doesn't pay attention to when you're ready. <laughs> I have to do it. And that's probably one of the reasons I started taking uh, Toastmasters and um, Dale Carnegie is a, a new way to express myself and which actually turned out kind of key because uh, part of that time and in transitioning into retirement, I did a webinar on uh, from the UK on mental strength, hmm, mm -hmm. mental strength, not mental health. But he said, when you're facing a tough situation and you're not sure you're up to the challenge, he says, recall to mind a warm memory. Okay, so my warm memory was like from third grade at Christmas time in the school play, but his was, he'd always wanted to uh, fly an airplane. And so his picture was, was a picture in the back seat of his, an, a little airplane that he was flying and he was giving his son an airplane ride. Oh. And that gave him mental strength. So the thing is, you hold that in your mind for like 15 seconds and then move forward with that challenging situation and it'll go much better than you ever anticipated. And so recalling those, well, a couple of weeks later, I thought, well, how come just have one more memory? Let's see how many I can come up with. My list, half of them were in front of people. Are you kidding me? Should my career have been in front of people? And um, I started acting as if, taking baby steps, as if that was, I was meant to be an influencer. And um, that's changed my whole life. Was there as, any big moment that mental strength played a big part in your life where you had to utilize those moments to get through it? Well, I think buying my first house was pretty taxing because, you know, but I also moved uh, from Seattle to Tampa, Florida with my job, and that was a pretty big decision. But the beauty of that, Alex, was that I had been sensing for two or three years that I would be leaving here. And... Um, I thought, well, what would I miss, you know? And I, I decided I'd miss seagulls. And so on the ferries, there's always seagulls following the ferries here. And so I got a great picture that I blew up into a poster of a seagull in the, in the water and the trees, green trees and all that. Um, and so going so far where nobody knows you, well, there was four or five people that had transferred there before I did. But... You know, it's often tough asking for help, but I got pretty good. At, I'd go into work and I say, okay, I need this kind of thing. Where do I got, go to find that thing here, you know, in Tampa? Because the stores are different, you know, and locating your insurance agent and your banks and all that stuff was, you know, you got to wing it. But there was, there was such a opportunity to mature in doing mm -hmm. that move. In that situation, what was a fun adventure for you making that move? I considered a little bit, Alex, um, to, you know, just toss my uh, care to the wind and just be whatever I want to be, you know. And so yeah. I, I figured I could be a nightclub, you know, um, what do you call it, where you go from nightclub to nightclub you know I could be anything I wanted to be because who knows you know yeah but that's not me you know um there's lots of beaches and long bridges down there <laughs> <laughs> but um I just savored the the colors and the 
landscape and the housing. There's a lot of peaches and and um, peaches and green. It seems like it was palm trees were were unique, and there was always a pretty good breeze there. But um, the whole, you know, taking in and learning the differences was um, very satisfying to my curious brain. You know, did public opinion ever play a big factor for you? No, I've heard of people saying, oh, what will people think? What will people, who cares what people think? You know, um, I guess some girls especially grow up, oh, I don't, you know, you, you have to wear the right jeans or the right haircut, you know, or whatever. And um, growing up on a farm, you don't pay any attention. I, I sewed my own clothes for the most part, you know, in home ec, we used to learn home ec. Um, well, in fact, I, I make these little art blocks and um, I love color. I love words of wisdom. I love sewing, you know, and um, that, that comes together as a nice, very satisfying thing to me to share with people because I started sewing in high school, but um, um, I don't know that that answers your question exactly though. No, it does. Cause that leads into one of the big words that was on that art block that you had, which was courage. And you're known as being the queen of courage. How did that name or that nickname title come about? And how does that empower people when they look at themselves saying, I can be queen of courage, or I have courage, king of courage, things like that? Well, very good question. I, I love that story because I'm a big fan of Hallmark movies. And this one Hallmark movie that actually takes place on a dude ranch kind of thing says, often when you go home from vacation, you go home with fresh courage. Yeah. I had become aware of that because when you're watching the, you know, the lake or the, the campfire or you know, the birds that are playing around or, you know, they're listening to their bird calls or, you know, the waterfalls. Um, there's oftentimes a little voice that talks to you. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I had become aware of um, having more grit and determination when I went home from vacation because you know, sometimes you put up with so much dumb stuff that you need to fix it and nobody's fixing it. And well, let's take care of that now. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that came from a Hallmark movie. They use, use the term fresh courage. And so that is the title of my book then, Fresh Courage in Retirement. And the, a learning about purpose is finding your purpose, essence, and fulfillment. So, um, you know, you live longer if you have purpose. You know, your healthcare costs are less when you have purpose. And uh, there's a contentment and a reason to get out of bed when, when you're living from a purpose. And um, the challenge is about a third of the boomers struggle with finding a new purpose in retirement because nobody told them that they're the boss now. Yeah. You know, and you have to make your own decisions. So... I love how you mentioned after what it's like to come home from a trip, because anytime I come home, I mean, I love the water. So I tell my family and friends, I'm like, we're going on a water trip somewhere. And I get there and I just enjoy it, enjoy the experience. And when I come back, I feel regenerated, re-energized, refreshed, and ready to take on what's coming at me next. And it's kind of like a new, not like a new start, but kind of like a, a new chapter because you needed that break to kind of stop stress. And I think a lot of people nowadays do that when they go on trips, but then I have to tell myself, like, you can't think about work when you're on a trip because why that just ruins it. And I've had that happen to me where a work thing happened and they called me. And it's like, you knew I was on a vacation. Why? And then the energy just changed right after that phone call. Yeah, there's a freedom, um, you know, the fresh air, the, the um, colors, the, you know, the, the green of the, uh, in Washington, I swear we must have a thousand shades of green. <laughs> 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 uh, 
but uh, not far from here, uh, kind of in a different direction, there's a little bit of a, I think it's a University of Washington forest project area that we can meander through. Um, there's a road that goes through it. And uh, I had come back from being at Mount Baker for a week. And um, I, the very next day, I had to have a glass appointment. Um, and this gal was saying that in J Japan, they, uh, especially for executives, they actually prescribe forest time as a, yeah, as a medicinal thing. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's what I just did. <laughs> You talked about purpose being a huge thing, especially with boomers and they're kind of searching for that purpose. What is that purpose for you in your retirement? Well, I have, uh, because I love to inspire and encourage people uh, I, with a behavioral science master's degree, that's, that's kind of my empowerment uh, focus in life. So I'm still empowering boomers. But I want to see, there needs to be such a culture change around retirement. And you know that word I mentioned at the beginning about potential? Mm -hmm. There's all this free time in retirement that people often get bored stiff with. And um, at Boeing before I left, somebody told me that, you know, there's a myth about retirement that when you retire, you're dead in three years. <laughs> that hurt. I, I was driving Lyft just before the pandemic started and somebody else told me that same myth was at their shop. And, you know, if you become a couch potato, couch potato, you probably are dead in three years. Or you become depressed or an alcoholic or suicidal. That does happen and nobody talks about it. So you've got to be determined and intentional about remembering who you are and cherishing those things that have always, that you've been good at. Oh, one of my, one of my blocks, um, have you forgotten who you are? <laughs> uh, it's actually a line from the, the Lion King. Um, well, I usually have it close by. It must be buried someplace here, but, um, um, we think because we no longer have a business card or title or a team to work with, we often get value from our coworkers. Mm -hmm. You know, they're kind of a mirror for us. And I don't know how it's affected you being at, you know, working from home. You still feel that mirror of adding value to them and to your, to your, uh, work team. But, um, that, is all gone in retirement. And you have to decide how that is going to be replaced. Um, uh, another one that I have is, oh, this is, you got to get out and be social in order to uh, replace some of that um, social interaction. I mean, just going to work on the bus or on your bike or whatever. The people that you know and you, I love to say hi to people that know me when I'm on my walk but um I I remember going I had I was first doing created a little program called what are you to want to do in retirement and I would take it to senior centers and I went to the the town that I was born in Anacortes and uh, I got there a little bit early so I stopped at the grocery store for a, a soft drink and something cold and I saw a couple different people sitting in the car all alone. And I thought, well, I'm glad they got out of the house. But if this is their, their whole world of social interaction, you know, it made me both happy and sad that, that older people, you know, the older you get, the less friends that are still alive, or you've lost your spouse. So that huge, huge transition. Um, I went to see my 88-year-old uncle here recently, and um, his brother had, when he died um, three, four years ago, said, Retire getting old isn't for sissies, because <laughs> there's so many adjustments to make. 
You mentioned in retirement that you're not having that interaction or you're kind of on a new chapter. Did it flash back to being that invisible child where you're not going into an office every day and seeing people or where you're able to recreate and make that not happen? Because you mentioned socializing, finding things that you're passionate about and things like that, that has kept you going. Well, that's a curious question. Um, my first struggle um, was bouncing off the wall, kind of like I've got my social security paperwork finally wrapped up and my Medicare paperwork wrapped up. And how do I know if my days are wasted? Because mm -hmm. being, being um, wasting time, I, I thought was kind of a sin, I guess. And it was important to me. And um, so I had learned how my essence state, my just, that was the first weekend of of coaching school and I made a wall hanging here and had it on the wall here for quite a while. And I know one day I came and read it three times and I started realizing what I lived from my essence, what mattered to me and what I had to give to the world every day felt right. Mm -hmm. So my essence is I am precious jewel of wisdom. I am colorful collaborator, motivator, and learner. I am tranquil, authentic, and pure inspirer. I light fires. I like that. What could, what could you do with the essence statement, you know? Because I, I don't feel like I have to prove myself to anybody. This is just who Sharon is, you know? It just naturally comes. So the power of everybody having that calm assurance of coming from their soul their spirit i call it essence um is just i call it heaven on earth joy <laughs> <laughs> i think a lot of people even no matter what age can take that and utilize it in their life i think you mentioned something where you don't have to do these things to prove to other people if it makes you happy you do it and i think I've lived that where I was trying to make other people happy, but if you're not happy doing it, why should other people be happy that you're doing it? So I think a lot of people should be a little bit selfish and just enjoy what you want to do because I think it kind of goes back to, you don't want to regret not doing it. So just well, keep going. I'm, I'm getting more and more convinced that making yourself happy is darn important. Yep. And um, it should start there, but you know, as we go through life and pay for that roof over our head on our car and experience, I mean, um, education, we get lulled into this is how life is instead of, and what's the value of happiness anyway? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm getting more and more convinced it takes um, a really special focused person that um, makes a real effort to me, I have to listen real close to what would make me happy today. I, I don't know that I always ask that particular question, but I get a feeling in my gut, what's the next thing to do? You know, the fact that I didn't do any, you know, business stuff over the weekend was pretty phenomenal to me <laughs> because I felt, one, I'm, I'm starting to... Um, feel a little bit of a burnout thing and needing to take a break but um the the relaxation and um privilege to chill a little bit was just something that I felt was a gift to myself so yeah so my but my I do have a sense of adventure so some of the things I'd like to do is get paid to travel to speak on <laughs> New Zealand's on my radar and Holland is high on my bucket list. I love tulips. So um, there's so much to learn when you travel that I'm eager to do that some more. So you talked about that you have this passion for traveling and being an international speaker. What made you want to get involved with that? And what's the biggest mission you try to give to listeners or potential listeners? Whoa. Well, I have done a few trips you know being always single 
um, makes it easy to um, have some, you know, checking out other places. And there's a certain amount of risk involved, but there's a lot of learning involved. So, um, and you, you, well, okay, one of my little blocks <laughs> is um, vulnerability is the uh, willingness to show up and be seen without any expectation, uh, without any guarantee of the outcome. That's where the adventure is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm a strong proponent of, of vulnerability because to me, it's like, well, and I'm also a knowledge manager, certified knowledge manager. And the principle of when I put out on the table what I know, and Alex puts out what he knows, then there's an opportunity for new knowledge to arise. Mm -hmm. And that's where collaboration kind of helps that happen. Um, and being willing to be um, co collaborative and transparent uh, and, and, and embrace what's possible. Uh, I've been a big proponent of um, the art of possibility. And if you get that book from the library, you hear the audio version. There's some snippets in there of the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra because the wife's husband is the conductor of the orchestra. Oh, so good. Okay, so um, what... Uh, Okay, so we're oh, adventure. Um, let's see. Well, here's my favorite saying, Alex. Um, if one has a talent and fails to use it, one has failed. If one has a talent and partially uses it, one has partially failed. But if one has a talent and somehow finds the uh, way to use the whole of it, they have gloriously succeeded and won a satisfaction few people ever know. And that's where that potential, you know, comes to um, the highest good. And that's by Thomas Wolfe. And um, I want that for everybody. That's, I, I love reading near-death experiences and um, the, uh, when they describe having been in heaven and all the fragrance and the colors and the beauty and the birds and, you know, it's just like amazing, you know, 10 hundred fold of what we experience here if we even have our eyes open for that. So when I speak of heaven on earth joy, that having a satisfaction few people ever know sounds to me like what would it be like to have heaven on earth for me individually and uh so so uh, motivating and inspiring people to continue to give and to learn and to help solve some of the problems of the world doing you know making the world a better place is right down my alley and um i i intend to do that until i'm past 100. <laughs> With being, loving the passion for being within crowds and speaking to people, did that give you that drive to get involved with podcasting? Um, well, podcasting kind of came from, I was approached by somebody from New York City <laughs> <laughs> to do, of course, they wanted me to pay for it, to have a, I think it was a 30 minute interview and, um, I felt like, you know, since this um, uh, mental strength webinar, seminar, I felt like I had something to say. And even in my coaching school, you know, I, I'm pretty quiet in groups, but I would lob in some, some nuggets right at the end. You know, I'd mention a book that would be fit, fitting the topic or whatever, but um, uh Let's see, where was I going with that? Oh, and let me tell you, one of the books that, that really wakened me up to listening to that still small voice inside was The Joy Diet. And um, if she has 10 menu items on her Joy Diet <laughs> and highly recommend it because that's how I started hearing that still small voice. But I think I sidetracked off of your question. How did you get involved with podcasting? Okay. okay, so yeah, I took baby steps as maybe I was supposed
supposed to be an influencer. And um, the first, uh, after, after that first paid for interview, um, they came back and said, well, you know, you had energy and you had a focus and we think that people would listen to you. And so we want to propose that um, we send you a, you know, professional microphone and get you on. And, and maybe people will even pay you to do it. And I never saw a penny out of them. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was, I was starting to plant seed, Alex. I um, have when, then I went on, that was just audio out of New York. And then there's some local ladies here that have um, audio and video and they did the uh, producing for me. And I just kept planting seed. And um, it, you know, one of my little blocks is you decide what stops you. And um, I, I have kept going no matter, nobody, tells me <laughs> to, how to stop or when to stop. Yeah, financially, it might stop me someday, but I all the more need to um, press in for uh, what's the answer to being able to carry on. But my book has been, um, you know, I just, uh, that came out in October and it is available on uh, Amazon. And it is an adult picture book because <laughs> I do have my blocks scattered throughout the book. The reason I did that is because our brain processes beauty different than just words, if it's just words. So it kind of like it goes into our spirit um, and maybe is more easily remembered when it's um, included with, with uh, beauty. Well, especially if people are like visual learners in a way where if they're visually looking at it, because I always tell people, I go, you can speak to me, but like, if I'm not seeing it, then it's like, it's hard for me to remember. And that's why I, I, I don't do well with like speeches and stuff like listening. I'm like, if you get something that tells me like what it is, I'll be able to remember it easily. So I like that you put those in there because when someone's reading it, they really know that this is important. She really cares about that message, that phrase that you're trying to tell a reader reading the book. Well, and it's, it's amazing too how we, how songs help us remember things. Yes. So what does the future look like for you? What are you hoping to accomplish in the next few years, both personally and professionally? Well, I have still a yearning to be married, but I don't let that stop me. <laughs> and um, I, I have just this last week. Okay, so the pandemic didn't bother me much at all. I am an introvert, and and yet I did. I know one day I had three or four Zoom calls. I think I've had three back to back today. Um, so I don't feel like I'm isolated at all. But um, I do like to put on some earrings and, you know, <laughs> dress up a little bit. <laughs> but um, I kind of got after myself this last week and said, you know, there are other people that need to feel heard and um, visible, especially in retirement. Um, so I, I decided I need to start, you know, picking up that phone, Sharon, and, and talking to people because they may need it more than I do. Mm -hmm. And, and that bonding that we've been so missing is um, so therapeutic. Um, so, and all of a sudden, I've started seeing a, a turn in uh, people asking for my ebook, which is a call to courage. It's on SharonRolf.com. And I give you a whole bunch of different ideas as to how you could be courageous to be seen and heard and do. And um, I, I have run a convention for 1800 people here in Seattle area back in the eighties. And I'm a little bit willing to consider putting on regional events for boomers where they can come together and, and maybe some sponsors of 
you know, wheelchairs or walkers or canes, you know, even, even um, eyeglasses and hearing aids are pretty valuable as you get older. But um, to inspire some energy in boomers that say, oh, maybe there is a better way to live and maybe I can contribute. You know, I've, for years, I have a chair sitting right here and I thought if, if the most I can do in a day is sit in that chair, I'm no more loved than somebody that can do 40 things a day. Mm -hmm. I can still listen. I can still um, talk. I can still write letters. Uh, there's there's things I can do even if that was my limitation. So you decide what stops you. In fact, here's here's another idea for um, uh, when you first retire and and you're bouncing off the wall like I did. They said an easy way to transition is do what you do for charity. So if you're a pilot. And uh, a lot of pilots and uh, first responders and people who travel a lot, they don't have a strong of a support system for them at home because they're not home much. And so um, they especially struggle with uh, that transition. But as they say, if, you, if you're a pilot, find somebody who needs something delivered or some people delivered and keep doing that as a quick and easy way to, to transition. You know, if you're bean counter, find somebody who needs some book, you know, help with their books or technology. But until you find something else that makes your heart sing, you know, start there. The final question I'll ask you, for someone that's listening to this interview based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals and rise to the challenge? Well, the, the biggest thing, and you probably know the answer, Alex, is to believe in yourself. You know, um, I, uh, I had to go through recovery work. Um, you know, my 40s was around a lot of, um, in fact, I remember sometimes going to church and hugging people because I needed a hug. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and, or if somebody came up behind me and said, boo, I know once or twice, I, I felt like I'd probably wind up on the floor. So, so healing yourself and, and being willing to face your awful, ugly truth that often as kids, we make sense of things and think that we brought it on or we played a role in what happened, you know, what happened to us. But um, that's, not necessarily the truth. We often have compensating behavior. You know, if, if you're not getting the attention you want from a, you know, as a five-year-old, you, you get negative attention if you have to in order to get some attention. And yet nobody tells us it's, it's time to let that go mm -hmm. in, at some time in life and give up that bravado clown act because it's not serving you now. And um, so, um, yeah, the best thing um, I can tell you is to um, be willing to face and have help doing it. That's what coaches are for, um, to both hold you accountable and the beauty of them having a, a different perspective. Um, the, one of the things, last things I learned at Boeing was how as a problem solver, I, I, taking sides wasn't effective. I had to be a neutral third party. And that was so powerful because I helped each other listen to themselves or, or help them come to a solution that both of them could accept. So uh, that's why a coach is so, so important to you is, is to get a new perspective. Oftentimes we have such limitations on ourselves. Oh, it's got to fit this box. You know, if it's not in this box, that's where that, that word curiosity came in. Think what you could do without that box. And yes, it will be scary to consider that. But the freedom beyond that is awesome. And you'll be glad you did. 
Well, Sharon, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. You're inspiring so many people and we're excited to see what the future looks like for you. Thank you. I'm pretty impressed with your questions too. <laughs> I would hire you. <laughs> <laughs>